service levels for travel. The honorable member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Always honored to uh, rise on behalf of um, the constituents of Thornhill, and I'll be splitting my time with the honorable member from Mégantic, Lérable. Mr. Speaker, more than two years ago, travel and many other parts of normal life came to a complete standstill. Countries around the world shut their borders, shut their airports, and shut down virtually everything else. And it was necessary to do so. They were, we were faced with a new virus we knew very little about. We had to do this until we found a way to live with COVID. We had to do this until we learned more. Two years ago, all of our allies were in the same place. We all shut our borders. We all had restrictions in place. Today, that is no longer the case. Countries around the world have dropped their restrictions and cancelled mandates. Canada is no longer in line with the rest of the world. Canada is an outlier. We know that most governments make decisions based on science, on research, and from the experts that advise them. All of our allies are lifting restrictions. So surely they cannot all be wrong. Surely the science cannot be different in Canada than anywhere else. Here, here. We might be able to understand the government's thought process on this if they would share the advice they've received. That's right. And when they've received it from the experts they claim that have given them this advice. However, they've refused to tell Canadians what metrics they're using, what plan they have, and what evidence these rules are based on. In fact, we haven't been able to find anyone that has told the government to keep the legacy health restrictions and the assault on mobility rights in place. Shame. That leads us to believe that on this side of the House, there is no evidence, there are no metrics, and that there is no good reason other than the ideological drive to punish those who don't agree with them. Oh. No, not only do these restrictions, not only are these restrictions, just to say, vindictive and discriminatory, we've said that a lot in this place because it's true, but they are causing chaos in our airports, which this House ought to be concerned about, which this Minister of Transport ought to be concerned about. We've all seen photos of passenger lines up, lined up for hours and hours on end with no chance of making their flight on time. They wait on a tarmac only to be shepherded into a lineup that, is, that, that exceeds the size of the terminal or the, the CBSA hall. Passenger processing times have quadrupled, and the industry experts told us directly this week in committee that these restrictions and these mandates are in part to blame. That's right. Mr. Speaker, our airports are famous for all of the wrong reasons, and we can fix that, at least in part today. The world is opening. People are finally traveling, that's a good thing, and businesses are growing again. Canada should be a world-class destination for people to work and play. But what do people abroad see? They see long lines, they see chaos, they see a place they want nothing to do with. They see COVID restrictions their countries did away with months ago. They see lineups that take longer than the flights themselves. They see a big neon sign at the border saying Canada is closed for business. They will choose to go elsewhere. The Toronto Board of Trade said that about 50 percent of travellers at Pearson, the home airport of the place that I come from, as well as the Minister of Transport, that's the airport he goes to most often, have had extensive delays last week. How does that create a good first impression? Our tourism sector can't afford this. Our small businesses can't afford this. Our country can't afford this. Mr. Speaker, it's been two long years. They need as much help as they can get. Right. And it's not just dollars and cents. These are people's livelihoods. They're the years of hard work. It's their life savings. It's simply hypocritical for the government to claim that they have businesses' backs when they continue to dig in their heels and stand by the measures that are now affecting everyone, not just those who oppose their views in the first place. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, tourism associations, the airport council, and now doctors have called for an end to border restrictions, vaccine mandates, and the broken ArriveCan app. They just want their livelihoods back. That's right. Mr. Speaker, here, here. There are acute labour shortages in this sector. We know that. And while the Minister blames travellers, saying that they are out of practice, we know the problem lies in part with the Canadian Airport Security Transport Authority under his purview. 
10 to 30 percent of security workers lost during the pandemic were never replaced. Surely a room full of people, many of whom use airports on a regular basis, would show an ounce of humility and listen instead of doubling down on the outdated practices and the more outdated talking points. The Ottawa airport alone needs 350 staff to operate properly. Right now, they have 172 that are fully trained and cleared. That's less than 50 percent. In every sense of the word, that's a failure, and we saw it coming. Canadians should know that CATSA is a user pay model. That means those who use it actually pay for it. It's not a run-of-the-mill government agency. It should be the best. This government runs a profit off of travellers. So what are travellers buying with their money? Longer lineups, some of the most archaic screening in the Western world, and missed flights. Airlines in Canada are fine for delays and poor service. And, what, and what's this government's liability when they are responsible? You laugh. Mr. Speaker, even the president of PHAC told carriers and airports they would remove the testing from those airports in January. It's May. Instead, this government has launched a new strategy consultation this week, and I can't think of a more worthless remedy in this environment. A government who cannot provide services that have already been paid for by the traveller is going to develop a strategy for people who they've punished and blamed already. Mr. Speaker, the workers who, who they haven't fired yet are subject to this incompetence as well. They are being forced to keep families on airplanes in 30-degree weather. Mr. Speaker, there is more outrage when they find a dog locked in a car in the summertime in a Costco parking lot. So why won't the Liberals listen? Well, we know they have problems accepting the diversity of thought and differing viewpoints. But are they seriously vindictive enough that they will continue to allow our economy to suffer just to prove a point? And they are laughing at this. On the other side of the House, we are hearing laughter at the suffering of Canadians. Shame. Shame. The people's voices in this, that this party brings to forward in this House each day might seem like strangers to the people laughing on the opposite side of this House. They are not strangers. Some of the honourable members forget that those who have, have, have they've othered, the ones that continue to actively disparage and lo look down upon are people too. They are our parents, they are our grandparents, they are nurses, they are tradespeople, they are everyday Canadians that we know in our communities. They have missed birthdays, they have missed weddings, anniversaries and funerals. They are hurting. And now the ideological crusade on them has crossed into affecting everyone else, everyone who did everything that they were asked to do throughout this pandemic. That's right. The vaccine mandates imposed by the federal government don't just restrict travel, they restrict our workforce. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Transport acknowledged that the issues we're seeing at airports would not be solved immediately. Some say that those delays and long lines could last until Christmas or later. We're not saying that removing the restrictions is a magic bullet. It's not going to solve all of the problems overnight. But surely airlines and associations and unions and chambers of commerce and businesses and now doctors can't all be wrong that these restrictions are causing delays. We owe it to them to support them after two years of closures and lockdowns in this country. We owe it to our constituents to listen to their concerns. We owe it to the millions of struggling Canadians who just want to see their economy reopen and start getting real paychecks again. We owe it to the travellers to allow them to finally travel quickly and easily. That's right. We owe it, well, we owe it to everyone in this country and everybody coming to this country. So surely the government trusts Canadians enough to allow them to travel freely. And surely members in this place want to see our economy back on track. And surely they want to support our tourism sector and our small businesses. So then surely they will vote with our party to lift the mandates and the restrictions and immediately revert to pre-pandemic rules and service level for travel. Our economy depends on it, Mr. Speaker. That's right. Thank you. Yeah.